home about 29 hours ago with my good friend Brett Tolman and flew through the night on Singapore Airlines. So when we both arrived this morning, our arrival at Sydney was relatively smooth, uh, despite the various protesting groups that we ran into on our way through the airport. Last time I was in Canberra was some 16 years ago when I came to see Professor Alan Fells, for those of you who remember the Professor. And it was the time when Paul Keating was the Prime Minister. And Jeff Dixon was then the group executive in charge of marketing commercial Qantas. It was a time when British Airways and Qantas were negotiating with the Trade Practices Commission to launch what was known as the Joint Service Agreement. So forgive me for not being back for a while, but I think it's 16 or 17 years. So flying away from London last night, listening to uh, a bit of Dame Edna Everidge, I also listened to the 12th man, for those cricket fans around here, which made me hark back to the good days of the Australian cricket team, when they were used to winning. <laughs> now, I'm just going to get my newspapers, honestly. <laughs> I'm not here to apologise that the Ponds are now much better than the Australians of cricket, but for those of you that are rugby uh, supporters, I hope, I hope that you'll be at Sydney Airport on Monday morning to welcome your team back to Australia. <laughs> because despite the fact that the All Blacks are now on their third string number 10, I think you're going to lose this weekend. Now, when we stopped in Singapore... We better than England already out. Yeah. <laughs> I, picked up, I picked up the Australian newspaper and I only looked at the first quarter, I didn't even open the thing, but the first, the top right hand corner of the newspaper said, Qantas War. So I thought that's going to be interesting. And then it says, Red Flag for the Industry. So at that point I thought I'd better open out and at least read the top half of the newspaper. And of course, the union split over the Qantas War and the green light for the carbon tax. Red Flag for the Industry. When the government's going to stop taxation on aviation? Okay, I arrived this morning and found pictures of Kevin Rudd kissing the Prime Minister. And I said, what on earth is all this about? But the arrival is historic in the sense of the carbon tax going through yesterday. Will it stay in place? Will the opposition let it stay in place? I have no idea. Right, I was hoping to see the Prime Minister this afternoon and I'll explain why uh, a bit later in my presentation. The World Travel and Tourism Council. Um, WTC was formed about 20 years ago by the leaders of the private sector businesses at that point in time. And it was formed to represent private industry globally. And the reason it was formed was people like Marriott and Accor, British Airways, American, East Japan Railways at the time, realized that individual companies, individual sectors, could not make things happen with governments. So they created this organization that sits over the top of those companies, and our mission is to go after governments and educate them about travel and tourism. What our does is to create a program. Gentlemen, thanks so very much for joining us. WTTC brought a lot of diverse interests together to form a coalition that is current around the world. I managed to rub shoulders to meet uh, the, the great movement of the industry. We're all about the same thing success. Together, we use our power of lobbying, for instance, to lobby state agencies and ministries. By bringing the industry executives together, government officials, and non governmental organizations, it has helped create a partnership committed to building tourism that balances economics with people, culture, and the environment. Its most important accomplishment is it really gathers the facts, because the facts have to be unassailable. WTTC's global database. Economic research as it relates to the travel industry the second time. It takes vision, it takes leadership, and it takes teamwork. To make governments truly understand the power of our own countries. Did you hear it back? You could hear the volume on the video? Yes, okay, great. Um, so WTC represents the top 100 travel and tourism entities around the world. Some of our members are in the room today. So all the big hotel groups, the big world airlines, car rental, cruise, and the tour operators. And we have the GBS businesses and online travel agencies. We don't have anybody from Australia. And I 
intend to put that right over the next couple of months. Now, what we do, basically, our mission is to, to go after governments and to educate them about the importance of travel and tourism. And that may sound strange to you, having listened to the earlier presentations today, but some travel and tourism entities are very good at educating governments, and some governments are very receptive to the messages about travel and tourism. But ironically, it's the developed world countries that are less receptive to the messaging than the developing countries like China and India and others. But what we're here to do is to raise the awareness of the economic and social contribution of the industry. And we influence governments, the media and wider society by putting data in front of them to really make them understand what the travel and tourism industry is worth to them. And finally, we promote sustainable growth. Now, sustainable growth is one thing that Australia has always done very well and will always remain focused on. We do this primarily by doing a lot of research. So in the early days, people like Bill Marriott and Jim Roberts and American Express realized that we had to produce research to make governments understand what travel and tourism is worth, and so that governments would take long-term investment plans seriously for infrastructure development. So we produce research that goes down to 181 different countries. We forecast 10 years ahead GDP, jobs, export income, and growth. And these are the statistics we take to governments. The next part of this is the opinions that we have. We have the top 100 travel and tourism leaders around the world, and their opinions count. The things that keep them awake at night, whatever they happen to be, they might be sustainability issues, human capital issues, taxation, visa, airline profitability. The opinions that these guys have, we collect and then we push out in the public forum. And because we have these key people inside WTTC, we can influence governments around the world and we can make sure they absolutely understand. So we are a single voice that has a global perspective for governments, media and the general public. When I talked about uh, going to see the Prime Minister here this afternoon, uh, one of the things we do is we work very closely with our, our sister organisation, which is the UNWTO, which is led by Tyler Griffith. We have a joint program running with them, which is an open letter that we give to heads of state, which asks the head of state to stand up publicly in their country and join uh, this particular initiative, which asks them to talk publicly about the impact of travel and tourism, what it means to them and their country, and what it means to their GDP. Now, we've probably done about 12 heads of state now. Uh, I was in Japan last week with the Japanese Prime Minister, and two weeks before that we were in China. And this is gathering momentum, and so I was particularly sorry to miss his skill out today. But I hope on my next trip to Australia we can include Australia in this very important initiative. So, let me tell you the global perspective first. As I said to you, we look out 10 years, but if we just look at 2011 for the time being, Travel and tourism accounts for 9% of GDP globally. Some 260 million jobs, that's 1 in 12 jobs on the planet, and 6 trillion US dollars. Now when we look at Australia and the Australian numbers that we have, we look at the wider travel and tourism impact, including the indirect impact and what we call the induced impact. And so, for example, if you will have a hamburger store in Bondi Beach, and the industry collapses around that and your store goes out of business, we would include that inside our statistics. So from our, our perspective, we look at Australia at this point in time, it's employing about a million people in travel and tourism, and with a contribution of about 94 billion Aussie dollars. The most important slide I have here, which is what really wakes up presidents and prime ministers I talk to, is a comparison of travel and tourism against the automotive industry and against banking. So we are a bigger industry than financial services, sorry, we're bigger than the automotive industry, and we're only just behind banking. And just think back over the last two or three years in the market turmoil, the government's focus on the automotive industry, the government focus on banking, the bailouts of those industries, particularly in the US. And travel and tourism, because we are so diffuse as an industry, we don't have a real point of coordination historically, we don't fight our weight when we're talking with politicians. Now, when we looked at 2011 at the start of the year, 2010 over 2009, we were coming out of this deep, dark recession environment, so the global travel and tourism industry grew by about 3%, 3.5%. And 
And at the start of this year, February, March, I was forecasting that we would grow globally at about 4.5%. The question mark is there because we've had a tremendous tragedy in Japan with the earthquake and the tsunami there, we've had the debt crisis, we've had the turbulence in North Africa, Egypt particularly been badly hit, we've had double bit recession been talked about certainly in Europe and the recent market turbulence. So my best guess is that we'll end up the year at about 3.2% instead of 4.5%. I was in Japan last week, as I mentioned, and I'll talk about this in the marketing context in a second. But Japan is beginning to recover very fast. I've been to Sendai three times since the earthquake and the tsunami. And it is impressive to see what the Japanese are doing to recover their industry there. But it is really, really impressive to go to the beaches and to see the cleanup exercise there. To talk to fishermen, there were 50, 50 fishing trawlers in this particular location. Each of these trawlers were picked up by the tsunami and thrown about two kilometers inland and were destroyed. So their industry is completely gone. And I guess the thing that really surprised me most was as they go through the rebuilding exercise, there are pots of land everywhere. Some of them are cleaned up and ready to rebuild. Others are full of debris. And the ones that are full of debris are those where they have not yet found the owner, and the owner is presumed dead. So it's a really tragic thing. And data going out for the next 10 years, our industry, we're forecasting, is going to grow as a percentage of GDP globally. So that 9% is going to go to 9.6%. The figure of $6 trillion you saw as a contribution on the previous slide in 2011, we forecast is going to go to $9 trillion. We're now operating, in 10 years' time, at 1 in 10 jobs on the planet because we'll have added another 60 million jobs at that point in time. And a lot of those jobs are going to be in India and China. For Australia, our forecasts again, bearing in mind how we look at this data, we think by then you'll have probably something like close to 2 million people employed as a direct result of travel and tourism. If we look at how the various markets are scheduled to grow over the next 10 years, it won't surprise any of you that it's Southeast Asia, India and China that are going to be growing much faster than the rest of the world. They'll all be growing at 9 or 10 percent. Australia is growing at sort of 2 and a half percent, which is about right for a developed market. We look at Europe, Europe is a two-speed growth. So you'll have UK, France, Spain and Germany moving at about probably a bit less than Australia, about 2%, and then when you go east into Europe, Poland, Latvia, some of these markets will be growing 6 or 7%. But Europe, as you can see, will be growing about the same rate as Australia over the next 10 years. And without seeing Jeff's thunder, because I know he's going to talk about China in a second, but most of the growth is going to be coming from India and China. And we reckon that in 10 years' time, those countries will, between them, have one-third of global travel and tourism and at the moment they're about one eighth. So they are going to take a lot of share from the developed markets over the next 10 years. Another interesting piece of data for you is that we believe there will be 2 billion, 2 billion new middle class consumers coming into the marketplace over the next 20 years. And of those 2 billion, 1.6 will be coming from China and India. And that clearly is where they want to be focused. And China alone, We've gone past this, um, this point now where the outbound Chinese of 58, 59 million are more than the inbound tourists to China. And that's going to explode over the next 10 years. It's going to be more than double in terms of numbers, and it's going to be treble the amount of spend that the Chinese are making when they fly around the world. So your focus on China is going to be critical because the competition for the Chinese consumer is going to be very great. So where does Australia fit in this global context? Well, at the moment you are the seventh largest travel and tourism economy in the world. We see that being stable in 10 years' time, in 2021. The arrivals are continuing to grow, despite the strength of the Aussie dollar and the floods and volcanic ash and all the other natural disasters you've had to cope with. But interestingly enough, the Japan numbers are in decline. And it's really worth having a good look at that and understanding why that is. Because if you go back 10 years, the Japanese are traveling in large numbers, and the office ladies, and why there were no office gentlemen in these parties, but the office ladies would go to Australia one year, they go to Hawaii the next year, and they go to Europe the third year, and they rotated around that triangle. But something's happened in terms of 
the attractiveness of Australia to the Japanese market, and they're not coming in the quantities they were before. So that to me is a warning. It's a warning that you, you need to get China right and you need to really nurture it. Because the Japanese started traveling in large quantities about 30 years ago, and sometime later the Koreans started, then the Chinese. Now the Chinese started traveling in groups initially. When you get on, on the airplane now, look at the people around you. These are wealthy capitals. They're not traveling in groups anymore. And that has to be part of a target market for you guys in the future. So, international rights are continuing to grow. Marketing, we're going to talk a bit about later. We'll talk about it in the panel session. I think, I, I believe that Australian marketing abroad is, is, has been really stand out in terms of quality of campaign. But I know there's a lot of criticism around it, and some of the individual campaigns maybe haven't quite fired as, as much as they should. But I think in, when I look around, uh, comparing it with other countries, some of the, what I call brand Australia advertising, has, has been very effective in the past. But I think there is an issue, and Jeff raised this in his speech this morning, about the coordination of marketing spend for a total Australia, and making that alive in the outside world. And the reason I mention that is, again, when I was in Japan last week, we had a day-long uh, symposium in Sendai, where all the prefectures of the Tohoku part of Japan had been clobbered by the tsunami and earthquake. We were all making presentations, one after the other, about the great things they were doing to market the recovery of their particular provinces. And then the Japan Tourism Association guys got up and talked about what they'd been doing, traveling the world, in marketing campaigns, I sat and listened to this for three hours, and, I, and at the end of it, I sat back and said, it's all great stuff, I and mean, you're all running very hard. It all makes a lot of sense to you if you're sitting in Sendai. But seeing from the view of a consumer that might be interested to come into Japan, what you're doing is substantially wasted, because there's no coordination between the prefectures there and total Japan and its approach to marketing. I think there's some lessons for, that, for the Australian marketing approach, which we'll come back to a bit later. Okay, just following the theme of where Australia fits, government spending is increasing, it's nearly doubled since 2005, and 4.9 million Aussie dollars has gone to about 7.5 million, so that's all good. Um, generally, the growth we're forecasting is good, visitor exports, the amount of money that people spend when they get here is on the increase as well. But is it going to be enough? Capital investment at the moment seems like a relatively small number to me in the scheme of what I see globally. And it's remained pretty static, around 21 million Aussie dollars per year. And I don't think that's going to be enough for the future. You know, when I read some of the press articles uh, that uh, come out in newspapers here, there's quite a lot of criticism about investment in infrastructure, and investments in signature hotels in places like Sydney, keeping up with the tourist attractions and the high quality attractions that people have in other parts of the world. So there clearly is an issue there, which, uh, which is a warning signal, I think. So we'll talk about marketing later. It's worth pausing to discuss what the US have done uh, with their approach to marketing, because the US has historically never marketed the US as a brand. I mean, it sounds a bit strange, but it's never happened in the past. So Florida and Vegas and the West Coast, a bit like the states here, have big marketing budgets, and they've gone out there and marketed their state. But where the US got it substantially wrong is that the consumer's first decision-making point when they're looking at where they go on their leisure holidays, they don't go to state level, they go to America, they go to Latin America, or they go to Europe. That's their first point of decision. When they decide that they're going to go to America or to Australia, then they dive down and see where they want to go within that country. Now, Australia is different because you always had a good brand marketing program run by tourism in Australia. But the US has never happened. But last year, President Obama signed into law this Corporation for Travel Promotion. This was May last year, so we're 18 months on. They've just appointed a CEO and a Chief Marketing Officer. The idea behind this is they take visa waiver tax income on a matching fund basis with private industry, and they throw in about $100 million to start marketing the US as one entity. Now, just to give you some sense of scale here, Las Vegas, where we had our global summit, in May, they use about $175 million just as one city in North America to position themselves. So $100 million for the country doesn't sound like a lot. But anyway, they get the message, they get the approach. 
and their thinking will follow. They'll have a pretty coordinated um, approach to marketing between the states in the US and the Central Marketing Organization. So, looking ahead a bit, the, um, the prospects are good, uh, I think. If you look at the growth coming out of China, and if you look at the plans and the Tourism Australia plan through to 2020, it all makes sense to me. I think having a specific China plan uh, is all very sensible. Um, you just need to make sure you follow through and make sure you don't lose that focus. Because as the market develops out of China, there's going to be huge competition for, for people traveling out of that. Sustainability is, has always been at the core of what you do in Australia, and you should never walk away from that. I think it's true to say you're one of the best examples around the world of being environmentally conscious and building in a very sustainable way. The heavy investment in marketing is good and needs to be increased. You're going to need more marketing dollars, not less, in order to keep a share of that inbound market that you want to attract. And finally, technology. Uh, technology has always been, I think, very leading edge in Australia. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time coming backwards and forwards when I worked for British Airways. And at that point, and still now, the US, the Australian domestic aviation market has always been very uh, very aggressive, very cutthroat, very competitive, and the technology in Australia has always been very good. But you can't let that slip, because technology is going to be key to marketing and distribution in the future. I want to thank WDTC for its leadership. We are wandering into this wonderful sweet spot now. Anybody who does not plunge in mobile application is going to is going to lose. The digital transformation is the next revolution. The mobile social web is so much data about what is going on, what our customers do. It's the most powerful collaborative tool in the history of mankind. You build the largest travel website out there. The business intelligence behind all this information is really going to completely change the landscape. Now with mobility, you can actually push information to the customer, and you actually create a relationship which is not transaction centric, yeah. but customer centric. Twenty percent, almost twenty percent of our travel periods are on mobile devices, and there is so much that can be done from right at the top of the funnel, the inspiration phase, all the way down to the point of transaction. The business simply grew so much faster than, than any of us thought it would grow. The guys in this video are all WTC members, and this, these clips are taken from our summit in Las Vegas back in May. And next year we're going to be in Tokyo and Sendai in April next year, which the Japanese government see as a very, very significant move, because they see that as part of the recovery process, that we're bringing all the world's leaders of these travel and tourism companies to Japan to give them support in rebuilding their, their country. So there are a few challenges out there still. We look at life from the Australian end of the telescope. Uh, when I was responsible for the Asia Pacific operation of British Airways many years ago, I had a wonderful map in my office which had Australia sitting in the middle of it and the rest of the world in very small, sketchy outlines. And I guess you, you will know which map I'm talking about. But it's very easy to forget when you're in Australia how impacted you are by the global turmoil in other parts of the world. Now the US and UK economies are not in good shape. The UK outbound market has been hit really badly this summer, and it's a combination of government stupidity and probably some of the recessionary impact due to government cutbacks that are happening there. Um, the double dip recession is seen by the Europeans now is clearly on the cards. If you look at market turbulence in the last four to six weeks, people are very nervous, and we talk to the banks, we're not out of this by any stretch of the imagination. And I was talking to Michael Frenzel, who, who runs TUI, one of the big tour operators in Europe. And they're budgeting probably a, a, a zero growth scenario for next year. And they see the UK particularly, and Germany, suffering very, very badly. The strength of the Aussie dollar is, uh, is always something that gets debated in newspapers now. I know it's changed a little bit over the last uh, three or four weeks. It's always held up as a reason for tourists not coming to Australia. Well, I don't buy that argument. I don't think people really think that way. Not unless it really gets extreme. But some of the labour disputes that you're having at the moment are, are really, really going to hurt you. 
Um, if you follow what happened with the British Airways industrial dispute, um, which went on for many, many months with, that, with their flight attendants, it damaged their business very dramatically over a period of time because their consumers lost confidence with them. And I worry on behalf of Qantas that you're going to end up in a similar situation here unless you get a trouble quickly. So labor disputes are not good. The aviation industry is in such, such <coughs> dire straits. If you go back over the last 30 years, the margins, the operating margins for the airline industry have only been 0.6%. 0.6% margin. But just think about that in your businesses. How is the aviation community, how is it able to invest in your aircraft when you're making such small profit margins? It's not at all easy. So, the last bit, I guess, is pressure on businesses to remain competitive. I'm, I'm astounded, frankly, by some of the taxes I stumbled into when I wander around the world. The passenger movement charge you have here in Australia, 47 bucks for each person that's moving, $650 million income stream. That's exactly the same as the APD in the UK. Yeah, passenger duty in the UK, this is a disease that spread to Germany and Austria now. It started off as a green environmental tax, it was moved into Treasury as a straight taxation mechanism, and to the UK government, it's worth two and a half billion dollars, billion pounds, I should say, every year. Two and a half billion pounds. I mean, you see the UK outbound market, or inbound into Australia, dropping. It's entirely because of that. The amount of money on the extra price of the ticket is dampening demand, it's stopping consumers coming. And I worry with the carbon tax here that's been announced that it will have the same impact, because the airlines will have no choice but to pass that on to the consumer and it will dampen demand. There's no question in my view. Okay, just a few more messages from a global perspective, and then I'll be happy to take any questions. First one is about visas. I think Australia needs the world in electronic visa processing. It always has, it always will. When I remembered on Sunday night I didn't have my Australian visa, I went online, worked very efficiently, I got an email back within probably seven to eight hours, asked me to click on the website and download the document. I didn't download it at that point. Twelve hours later, I got another email with the PDF documents attached, which made it easier for me to print. Very good, very user-friendly. I wish you could teach other countries around the world to do it. However, it is still a significant barrier to travel. Those of you who have tried to get a Schengen visa recently, you will have gone through a very complicated process. You have had at least three interviews, you have been fingerprinted, photographed, you have had to provide six or seven different documents for employees, bank statements, to even get a visa to go for one month to the Schengen countries. The UK is outside of the Schengen Agreement, and the UK Prime Minister doesn't understand why foreign travellers don't come to the UK. Quite simple. If you're coming out of Asia and you're on a week or ten days trip around Europe, why would you pay additionally to get a UK visa? The answer is you wouldn't bother. If you look at the US, um, at our global summit in May, we had most of President Obama's uh, key people there. Janet Napolitano, Ray LaHood, um, who else was there? Ray LaHood, Commerce Secretary, and we also had Barry Jarrett, who's a principal advisor to President Obama. And the discussions there were all about the market share that the US has lost since 9 11, which in numbers terms is 606 billion US dollars. And they lost it because they tightened up on the visa processes. They've made it almost impossible to get a visa if you're coming out of China and Brazil. And when you get to the US, the way you get treated through security puts people off. So the big debate around the US at that point was how can the US get more inbound market share from Brazil than China? And what is the return on investment for each consular official in locations in Brazil and China that's going to bring more dollar income to the US? That $606 billion number is a huge number. And for the hoteliers around in the room, that's 3.5% points of occupancy over a 10 year period that's been lost down to this particular issue. So visas is one of our global campaigns. We want to see more electronic visas. When I walk around the world, I hold Australia up as being a visionary in this area. And we have to have more governments that do the same as you guys do. Second barrier to growth is around taxation. Taxation is destroying industry profitability. It's not just the airlines, it's also true of hotels and restaurants. Some countries around the world have a VAT rate of 25%. 
I was in Copenhagen recently, and they were asking me why their tourism ministry was in decline. Simple answer. If you're going to charge 25% tax for somebody who can't stay in a hotel, makes you the most expensive city in Europe. Why would people come? It doesn't make any sense. So taxation is a big, big issue for us. APD in the UK, my belief is that of that £2.5 billion pound income stream they're getting in through taxation, the UK is probably losing about £3.2 billion off its GDP in lost jobs, lost growth opportunities, and dampening down the market. And that's what we're setting out to prove. Where APD was put in place in the Netherlands and Holland, their tourism outbound market collapsed. And so they very quickly reversed that out. So again, our role in life is to go and talk to governments, make sure they understand the mistakes of some of their colleagues in other parts of the world, and try and get them to reverse out some of these crazy taxations that we put in place. Okay, so taxation is the second thing. And the last one for us is around sustainability. And sustainability is something that we are very, very focused on. But let's just talk about aviation for a second. If aviation is responsible for 2% of carbon emissions, it's not really very much. Because I think cows are responsible for 16 or 17%, something like that. So 2% is really neither here nor there. But the aviation industry has really badly managed this in terms of the press relationships around the world and probably been unfairly victimized for this whole issue of carbon emissions. But just think about this for a second. At $95 per barrel in 2011, the oil companies were estimated to make nearly $170 billion from sales of jet aviation fuel. And after refining, it gives them a profit of $16 billion. Okay? This was at $95 per barrel. It's higher than that now. $19 billion profit for the oil companies. That's more than the airline industry has ever made in any one year in its entire history. So there's something wrong in the profitability chain here. If you're operating at a 0.6% operating margin in the airline industry, and look at the company's profits that are coming out of the oil companies, is it surprising that the oil companies are not really speeding up the development and processing of biofuels and other alternative fuels? There's something wrong in the system. So sustainability, carbon emissions and biofuels is going to continue to be a real thing for this industry. So on the topic of sustainability, Our industry is at the forefront of protecting our natural base asset. We want to achieve a 34% reduction by 2020. We have a goal of reducing our carbon footprint by 50% by the year 2050. You come to do everything. Great pleasure to sit here with uh, Ted. We need to completely uh, phase out of our fossil fuel uh, energy system. There's a smart way to do it, but it's stupid. The WTTC has been a leader in bringing the industry together around the world for reducing CO2 emissions. To that end, that's what I said. We don't, we don't have a, we don't have an industry. Now I have to say that Jeff and Andrew are fantastic ambassadors for this country when they are traveling abroad. And um, when we have a global summit, like we do once a year, uh, we need more Australian input because we're not part of this global game at the moment. So let me summarise. Investment in infrastructure is going to be key for, for this country. You're going to need an increase in investment over a period of time. Investing in people is also going to be key for travel and tourism to hold on to key talented people in the face of other industries, mining and others who are going to be taking these people away. Investing in people is also going to be key. Investing in marketing, you need more dollars, not less, and I would certainly say this would be better coordinated between state marketing and total Australian marketing. You have got to get rid of some of these taxes. You cannot stand and watch a carbon tax being put in place like, like happened yesterday without objecting to it. You have to educate the world about the ability you have in electronic visa processing because that's one of the standout things for me about Australia, along with your focus on sustainability. <laughs> Keep that focus on sustainability. Please don't lose it. And my last comment is, go find some decent cricketers. Thank you very much.